Um, so I'm going to start uh, by saying um, my, my participation in the Labour Party started in 1970. That was my first election. My parents sent me out to do all of the leafleting uh, in our local area in Edinburgh South. Uh, and my first uh, ward meeting when I was 15, um, they still read out the branch minutes at every meeting, um, which is an old tradition which some will remember, but I hope not many. Um, and then in my first GC uh, was Edinburgh South, where Gordon Brown was also a delegate, uh, and the GC were obsessed with nationalizing all the banks in the UK. So um, the 70s was a difficult time to be in the Labour Party. The 80s was too. Uh, that's when I first met Margaret, um, when we were expelling Trotskyists from our own uh, council groups. Uh, the great thing about that period was at least we knew what we were doing was what the leader wanted. We were actually, the leader was modernizing the Labour Party in Neil Kinnock. Uh, and the thing about it, I mean, Tony's victory was phenomenal but it stood on the back of work that was done by previous leaders, by John Smith, uh, who sadly didn't uh, see the victory, uh, by Neil Kinnock, who did see the victory. Um, and the party took, I mean, they were a collective. It took a lot of change. It took a lot of us to work at every level. Uh, and I'm going to come on to, the, I was asked to talk about spin and messaging. And one thing about spin and messaging is it's good to have message discipline because it's good to let everybody know what they should be saying about what we're doing, because politics is a contest. It's actually, it's a contact sport. And if our people don't know what to say, their people definitely do know what to say. And it's not good about us. So we do have to have message discipline. You do have to have discipline. That's coming back. I think social media under, un, undermines it. But I think it's really important to, to, to understand. 97 didn't come from nowhere. Uh, but we mustn't fall into the kind of academic uh, banality of the victory was inevitable, but also the victory was sort of insubstantial and irrelevant. Um, it was a major moment. I came out of Royal Festival Hall at uh, four in the morning, and the light, you know, it was dawn. It was a great dawn. Um, and all along Waterloo Bridge were ordinary Brits, Londoners, applauding every single person who left. I got out to get my taxi to go home at four or five in the morning because I knew I'd see, I was working for Harriet Harman at the time. I'd see Harriet first thing in the morning uh, because you know we, she had to get a cabinet position. We had to then go into the department to work on it. But coming out, it's so humbling to come out or, as just an ordinary person, ordinary party staff being applauded. And the people on the bridge weren't applauding me. They weren't applauding anybody who came out. They were applauding our country. They were applauding Britain because they could see that we were a nicer country than we had been being governed as. And that immense relief that people had, that, you know, uh, the quote from Wordsworth is relevant. We did feel a different country. Now, whether or not that was fulfilled, uh, and I think in many ways it actually was fulfilled, because I think one of the things that, is, that, that was required was for the Labour Party to understand the largest single class in British politics by the mid-90s was the salariat. It was the white-collared monthly paid workers. Labour did shift the class it paid attention to because we followed the working classes where they went. Working class people became middle class. The Labour Party, the Labour movement was established for one purpose and one purpose alone, to give working class people by right, what middle class people accepted because they're standing in society. They just, they just expected they'd get it. So we worked for our people and we gave them. Over a century, they became middle class. And do you know what happens when people get better educated, they get more prosperous, they get more picky about their political parties. Um, they actually choose as voters, just as we want to give them choice uh, in public services. So our adjustment, was necessary and our adjustment was profound. And the thing about the Labour Party is we are at our worst when we are at our most condescending to other people and their lifestyles. I'll tell you one thing about Tony. He never condescended to the voters of the country, the lifestyles. I've been in passionate discussions in number 10 at one point on housing policy where an unnamed senior advisor said, why do people want double garages? To which the answer is, it's none of your business. It's actually literally none of your business why people want double garages and four bedroom houses when they've only got two children. 
Um, but we do have a Fabian element of us, wanting to control people's lives. And the great thing about Tony was he wasn't a Fabian at all, was he really? Um, <laughs> but there are many people in the Labour Party for whom victory is the first betrayal. Uh, you know, only to it goes like this, it's simple. Only Tories can win elections. Tony Blair won elections. Oh, Tony Blair must be a Tory. So those weren't Labour governments. Because if Tony had been Labour, like he'd have lost, like Jeremy Corbyn and Gordon Brown. And um, so, now, why did we have spin doctors? Uh, because Labour faced a hostile media. Why? Because in the end, there is a contest between capital and Labour. And capitalists have a side, and capital has a voice, and capital owns uh, media. There's more democratization now with, you know, with these things and the multiplicity of channels, but there still is a power of the mass media. Look at the way um, the Daily Mail has devoted front pages for a week to Beergate. Um, there is, the Labour Party faces a hot, and Keir Starmer, He's not in any way the kind of threat yet to the Tories that Tony was from the minute he got elected as leader. Keir is definitely going to be the next prime minister, but he is not feared as much as Tony was. Uh, and so what they're going to do, who knows, uh, over, the, over the next period. Uh, we do need to control the messages that go out. We do need to be disciplined. Uh, because if we step outside what our program is, if people are loose in what they say, it is seized upon by, the, by a Tory government, it's seized upon by the Tory press, seized upon by the Tory media. And look, the other thing about spin doctors and advisors was it's part of a professionalization of politics. People might not like that politics has become a profession, uh, but the alternative, what's the alternative? The alternative, the 1983 general election where there was a vote by the National Executive Committee of the Labour Party to confirm that the leader of the Labour Party was Michael Foote. <laughs> National Executive Committee meetings at which one guy was once asked by a union, by a union representative, why are you not voting in these? He said, I'm the close protection for the party leader. Um, we, we've gone from a long way, in the last Labour government before Tony, when Dennis Healy had to signal from the floor of conference to be allowed by the chair. We had to have professionalization. Um, it started with Neil, it carried on with John, but it, but it, but it came to its full with when Peter and Tony and Gordon worked together and when Alistair Campbell was brought on board. And that brought to us a professionalization to send a message across. Now, did we make a difference? We made a profound difference. We increased workers' rights every year that we were in government. We not only did that, we increased employment, reduced unemployment, increased employment, increased workers' rights every year. That's a major thing. It's actually, and I know people don't like to hear it, it's actually a, a direct rebuttal of the notion that Labour is neoliberal. Neoliberals believe that giving workers' rights increases unemployment. We just proved that in office. So did we make a difference? I could go through a whole list and we could all do the whole afternoon on that. Did it backfire on us? To have spin doctors. I don't believe it did, because I think ha not having message discipline, not controlling the media cycle, we would have been in a lot, a lot more difficulty, a lot more quickly than we were. What happened, it's not surprising, the, both the press and the public modernized the way they consume politics. It's right to say, as Stephen said, that modernization doesn't stop. But there's a banality about some of the things that are said about New Labour, as if we would today say 1997 is the template for winning in 2022 or 2024. The point of modernization is you modernize in the context you find yourself. The difficulty, I mean, the, 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 Cor the Corbyn, I mean, the, the, the Corbyn proposition, Jeremy Corbyn, when he was leader of the Labour Party, if he did an event at the weekend, took time off during the week. He treated the job as party leader as a 40 hour week. So probably time and a half, probably if you do half a day on Saturday, you take a day off during the week. He genuinely did that. Now that isn't modernization. I think, I think Corbyn was a betrayal of Corbynism. I think Corbynism asked some difficult and profound questions about the modern economy 
came up with the totally wrong answers, but started to answer, ask some of the right questions. But did we, did we need to modernize? Yes. Should we have carried on modernizing? Yes. Should we have stopped losing? Yes. Should we have, as Tony used to say, you, know, you can't win every election. That's one of, the false, one of the false accusations of Tony is that we lost at the end of it, right? You can't keep winning. What you have to be is competitive at every election after you lose. And what we managed to do was go, we lost in 2010 what the public was saying. They voted Tory because they wanted a more left-wing Labour Party. And we tried that 2015. <laughs> then we lost in 2015 what the public want, a more left-wing Labour Party. Tried that in 2017. Didn't win that election. Um, tried it in 2019. We've tested that notion to destruction. So in the end, I think I have two, you know, there's, 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 there's one observation and one regret. Governing isn't campaigning, but you have to have a campaigning attitude when you're in government. And that is why we have adopted, that's why we had spin doctors, advisors, and professionalization. If you look at the, at the the SNP, successful SNP government, and, and, and the successes when there are success, the Tory government, they're a tribute act to the Labour Party. They simply campaign in government. They don't govern at all. They simply campaign. Uh, and my regret, to be honest, I don't think we shifted uh, enough rights to workers collectively. I think the balance has obviously shifted against Labour since 1997 drastically. And I think if we'd given more rights uh, to workers, that would have been a better thing to do. I say that in the full knowledge as former political secretary, there were not union partners, apart from the time when John Monks was head of the TUC, there were not union partners with whom to actually do a deal. We should still have tried to do a deal because it was the right thing to do. And the fact it was hard for me proved it was the right thing. So um, uh, that's it. Thank you.